This episode of the Wedding Film School Show is brought to you by Musicbed, the best music licensing platform for wedding filmmakers. Head over to themusicbed.com and enter our code WFS on checkout to get a free month on your annual wedding subscription. Now, on to the show. What's going on with White and Reverie these days? I feel like a lot's changed in the past few years for us. It's no longer like our main source of income. Five weddings a year max, pretty much. You know, we've worked really hard over the past 12 years. As we kept on growing, we're able to fine tune the type of couples we wanted to work with. I went to a workshop in Australia, to, was meeting everybody that knew who White and Reverie were. And then we were talking about some of our other color grades and LUTs. And they're like, wait, you own Gamut? Yeah. I use Gamut LUTs. So you're telling me destination weddings aren't all they're cracked up. We loved the content, but it was exhausting. The flight got delayed and we had to go through four different airports on the flight back. Found out that our daughter is vomiting at our friend's house that's watching her. It's just chaos. White and Reverie is kind of bigger than the films. They're like, who's your favorite filmmaker? And they're like, White and Reverie. I'm like, what's your favorite film they made? Um, like they, it's just like, it's so ingrained in people. So many they can't choose. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Wedding Film School Show. My name is Jared. We have another awesome episode for you today. Per usual, my business partner, friend, and companion, business companion, Jason Person. McCutcheon, in the house today. And we have a very special guest, but beforehand, Jay, how was your weekend? What's going on? I shot a wedding, um, a lot of fun. And um, I, I actually shot a wedding with the cheapest camera that I could buy on Amazon. How did that go? <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't your only camera. No, 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 it was not. But I shot... Uh, just, you know, I just wanted to prove once and for all, is it, is it the gear or is it the artist? Right. And I think it's the gear. Okay. I think, I think it is the gear after using that camera. Interesting take compared yeah, to every um, Facebook comment that's ever been made. About oh, dude. Topic. I mean, literally the thing is like vibrating. It would just like, it, this is like the simplest camera in the world and it's just pumping focus automatically it, the whole time. It would just randomly just go green the screen and have to just force close the camera it was uh anyway we're gonna release a video like of that on youtube it could be out already so go check it out if you want to see someone struggle definitely. through a day with a terrible camera definitely and make sure you guys you're, you're watching this show probably listening to the show the wedding film school show uh many of you already know that we have a youtube page called wedding film school where we do youtube content uh lots of gear reviews and whatnot it's a great place to educate yourself learn about new gear coming out um, and speaking of learning, we have an awesome guest today. Jason, why don't you introduce our guest? So when I was like, when I started wedding filmmaking, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, I remember, um, we kind of still motion and then probably Ray and probably the first hipster people I saw were white and reverie. And I remember watching a video they did, like it was these people hiking or something. And I was like, I, I couldn't, and I'll have to ask him about it, but they they had like a it looked like a wire or something and they were running a camera like down a wire or something it could have been a drone i'm not sure it was a little before drones but there was this all this produ produced like really like super high detail shooting and i was like screw those guys like <laughs> i was like that's not a real I'll never be able to do that <laughs> <laughs> and, um but honestly like um they were like one of the first people who i think kind of defined a certain style of wedding filmmaking that um, was, you know, like it's been enduring brand and enduring type of filmmaking. And so here we have Caitlin from White and Reverie. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. It's going <laughs> good. So um, do you remember the shoot I'm talking about? Uh, when you mentioned it with a wire, um, I think I immediately went to a film that is not ours. Uh, I think that was from Iris and Light, which they did Maybe. this epic hike and it was beautiful, and they had this jib shot of this couple climbing up a mountain, and I instantly bought a jib because of that one video. <laughs> Maybe and that's started what bringing it was. Yeah. a twelve foot jib to weddings for two years. Me too. Filled up with water for the counterweight. Mm -hmm. yep. every the Hercules crane. Yep. Yes. Yep. yes. So <laughs> it wasn't us, but I'm glad that you subconsciously associated that with us. Yeah, so it's a good film. <laughs> but yeah, still, screw that guy. Screw that guy. <laughs> <laughs> for doing that <laughs> so um but yeah white and reverie um if you don't know is i think you know among the more known wedding filmmaking brands and 
you know, artists in the world. And you guys are doing, um, you know, pretty high end events and stuff. What's going on with White and Reverie these days? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that. I feel like a lot's changed in the past few years for us. I mean, we've migrated from full-time wedding filmmaking to kind of, I would say it's more of a, um, I wouldn't say a side hustle, but it's no longer like our main source of income. And we've kind of leaned into other avenues in our life. Passions have shifted. We've had a daughter, less travel over the past couple of years. And we're now looking at about five weddings a year max, pretty much. So we have the, um, we have the opportunity to guys to say a no to a lot of uh inquiries, uh, which is a good place to be in the sense that, you know, we've worked really hard over the past 12 years of our our company and we didn't have that luxury for the first few years and we we're just taking anything and everything. And then as, as we kept on growing, we we're able to fine tune um the type of couples we wanted to work with and they resonated with our work. And I think because we've shifted away from having to hustle to make a living is we wanted to get to the point where our company worked for itself. And part of that was um, being able to say no to certain inquiries, which would allow us to say yes to the things that we wanted to do. And part of that also implemented um, us moving from across the country because we lived in Florida at the time. We wanted to live in Colorado where we visited for our wedding anniversaries. We got married in Colorado. And we built our company to become destination-based, which allowed us that freedom and flexibility to even eventually move to uh, Denver, Colorado, which is where we live now. And after we moved, we got pregnant. And so we have a seven-year-old daughter now. And so that's also probably the biggest challenge for us as wedding filmmakers, where we both work for the company and not one of us just stays home with the kid, is is managing uh, how are we going to have childcare and take on a gig or pursue the things that we want to do? I mean, literally this weekend we're traveling to California. We've booked the client. I think we're finalizing the contract today and we're filming it in four days. Uh, and then we're going to travel out to an event in the Catskills and we're going to be there for a few days as well. But finding childcare last minute has been the most difficult thing. We don't have any family that live close by in Colorado too. And then all of our other friends and everybody's just so busy. And I was able to finally snag my mom to fly up from Texas and she's going to watch our daughter for three days. And it's this small little window where she can fly in and fly out and still do the other things that she has on her schedule. So very thankful for mothers out there. Um, but it, it's been very stressful. Uh, it's planning gigs while still managing a family. So I think that's why we've kind of toned back and we're only doing about five gigs a year now. So you're telling me destination weddings aren't all they're cracked up to be. <laughs> Man, I, I mean, it's going to be a fun experience, but I think all the stress leading up to it. Um, we just did our first wedding of the year a month, month ago in Anguilla, um, which is uh, an, a nice island in the um, Caribbean. And I ended up almost getting, I think I got a heat rash. Yeah. I got so, I just like broke out with uh, <laughs> all over my face the next day and got a heat rash. Um, I was wearing a double breasted suit in the sun on the beach, which I guess you shouldn't have done. <laughs> and it was just hot. And um, we came from winter Colorado. So it was definitely a different environment. Um, we loved the content, we loved the location. But it was exhausting. The travel there, we ended up, the flight on the way back home got delayed and we couldn't come home for another day. And we had to go through four different airports on the flight back, found out that our daughter is vomiting at our friend's house that's watching her. And it's just chaos. And we're like, oh, luxury travel destination weddings is the job to pursue. And um, <laughs> we just wanted to get home to be with our daughter and <laughs> take it easy. Yeah. So, Kaylin, great uh, background, by the way. Great studio setup. I know you spent a lot oh. of time working on it. Uh, yes. Beautiful. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, hop onto YouTube and, and take a look because it's, it's worth it. But um, so only taking about five gigs a year nowadays, yep. um, roughly. How do you decide which gigs to take? Is it more couples you just vibe with or is it kind of more destination, like combination of both? What are you looking for in the couples that you take nowadays? Yeah, I, because we're only taking five, we want those to be um, very 
focused on our four pillars that we've kind of mentioned before in the weddings that we are considering. The four pillars that we have that we've decided on is, is we came to a point in our career where we were able to have the flexibility to say no to certain weddings. And so that meant saying yes to the ones that we want to do, uh, meant they needed to be tailored um, specifically for our style and the type of vendors we wanted to work with. So we ended up looking back at all of our films and analyzing which ones did we love, which weddings did we love the most, which ones had the best story, which ones did we not like. We kind of made a pros and cons list of things that we loved, and that helped us establish kind of our why and our kind of our four pillars that we wanted our ideal client to be. And that, first of all, we realized the films that we loved always had couples that had great chemistry together. So we wanted to make sure that if we're booking a client, that when we meet them and we have a Zoom session or meet them in person, that there's really good chemistry there. Uh, um, second of all would be uh, location. Is it a place that we want to travel? Is it a place that doesn't take a lot of travel? We want to be home closer. Uh, a third one would be uh, our vendors. Uh, are they people that we can be creative with, that we love working with, that we get excited to be around? Um, or is it somebody that we've wanted to work with? We consider that. And then the fourth thing is investment. Is this a wedding that um, is going to be worth it for us? And sometimes we take a discounted wedding because it hits all three of those other pillars. But the fourth one is just like the investment's a little bit lower, but man, we got a great vendor team, awesome location. The couple's amazing. You know what I mean? And I think that's where we looked at where if we can nail three out of the four pillars, that's our ideal booking client. Um, as long as couples with chemistry is always the dominant one across the spectrum. Uh, that's where we've kind of landed. And part of that is we're mainly taking gigs that are multi-day weddings because we're going away from our daughter we want that to be a week. If we're already away, let's just add another day on. So we're pretty much only booking weddings that are multi-day events now, uh, which does move us up into a different bracket a little bit too as well with our pricing. Uh, and then we're mainly booking weddings through either vendors that recommend us or planners. Um, and they know kind of our, our mission and our pillars. So we know that if we're getting an inquiry from that planner, we're going to want to book this wedding kind of thing. And that's been helpful as we navigate which couples to say yes to and which couples to recommend to other filmmakers. Yeah. You know, you kind of mentioned a lot about the couples you want to work with. And, you know, this is what I think people don't really understand when it comes to having real partners, like wedding planners that are your partners, creative partners, um, is like I was talking to a planner a couple of weeks ago and she's like, well, who do you want to work with? right? Well, what couples are you going to vibe with? I want to connect you with that. I want everyone to have like, like having those kinds of conversations, maybe not specifically, maybe not every little detail, but like, I think making it known to your partners, like what is exciting to you and what is inspiring to you and what, what you really want to be doing will help you get more of those gigs. Because now we're at a place where I'm sure you guys see this too, where the people you're working with are like, Oh, this would be perfect for white and reverie. Like I'm mm -hmm. going to bring them on and like they've kind of done some of the work for you. They know the, what you're looking for and what, what, mm -hmm. what clicks and stuff. And I think that always starts with dialogue, right? So how, how did you guys kind of go, like, are you kind of, are these like, you talk about it on wedding filmmaking education, these pillars and stuff. How are you mm -hmm. educating the people you're working with um, so that they give you the types of couples that, or is it just kind of, I think maybe, intuited by osmosis by everyone who you want to work with. <laughs> I mean, part of it is um, our films. I mean, when people watch our films, they get a sense of our style. They get a sense of the couple. Um, we just, the wedding that we booked in Anguilla um, was recommended to the bride by the photographer because we worked with the photographer before and the clients were having trouble finding a filmmaker that they resonated with. And um, the photographer's like, I've worked with these people before. I love them. You should consider them. And they watched our film and instantly felt connected to it. Uh, and it's because that photographer has seen our films. He's like, I love how they feel like movies. I feel like they're, you feel emotion connected to it. Um, and there's a little more depth in there. And so he was able to translate kind of what the client's looking for with our work, which kind of all meshed together there, which was nice. So, uh, and then planners, uh, sometimes any planners like our favorite planner to work with is uh is troy williams from simply troy we worked with him whenever we did um our first big celebrity wedding and 
I think he opened up the door to how important a creative team is mm. for clients. And that was where we did a four hour walk through the day before <laughs> of the wedding. But we were going through, hey, here's the dance floor. Uh, I have this reflective flooring. I imagined the fireworks going off. Which angle would look good for you to film where you can get the reflection of the ground and the fireworks? And he's like, I'm going to give you seven minutes of fireworks. Is that long enough? I'm like, yes, that would be way more than I anticipate. <laughs> Two minutes would be awesome. So, okay, seven minutes. And they're like, okay, we need to position it here. And he's brainstorming with us and the photographer, getting ideas of what's going to work great. And I think we just got spoiled from that from that wedding and learning to work with a creative team to create an amazing masterpiece for our clients from all the different vendors. And so moving forward with that, um, sometimes we'll get clients that might not – um, be the location that we want, but we know that planner is going to be there and we know how he approaches film or weddings and we want to be a part of that. So um, I think that's kind of just the way we've approached things. And uh, he gets our style and he loves working with us. So anytime he wants to recommend us, we're on one of his, you know, top three list of people that he wants to recommend for filmmakers. Um, but part of that is translating the film. I think just people get a sense of it in the films that we tell. Uh, and then with the clients through our meeting, I mean, cause we'll meet with couples and we still sometimes don't book those clients. Um, but part of that is we just need to get a sense of who they are and kind of see if we're matching up on the same page and vibe and everything. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I love what you're saying just about like, you know, Troy seems like he just already has a vision and already knows what you're kind of looking for in a, in a film. He's like mm -hmm. picturing it there right with you. Um, and I found that as we kind of work our way up into, I wouldn't say the luxury market because luxury market, I think is probably twice as much as what we're doing, but the mm -hmm. high end market, I would say working with like the planners. premium market or something. Yeah. yeah. Premium market. Yeah. I would say, uh, still the, the rich people, platinum diamond level <laughs> market, uh, <laughs> but working with planners who I think, um, are learning. Like, I feel like we're kind of in the stage where planners are still learning what, us as filmmakers are looking for and they're asking I think that's the right across questions. the industry too. I think yeah. like people five years ago, a wedding planner had no idea how to accommodate for a filmmaker yeah. except for maybe certain ones. Now I think people are learning like, Oh, the film is important. It's part of my yeah. release. It's part of my material. It's part of yeah. the mm -hmm. couple's experience. So yeah. Yeah. And when this goes on, cause we've, I've started to have those questions like from top tier planners that we are working with, and they're like, hey, what's the best angle that, you know, where should I put the cannons beforehand? Like, we'll get those emails. Here's my layout. Um, you know, not here, the Canon cameras, the yeah, actual uh, <laughs> confetti <laughs> cannons confetti or, or, or streamer cannons right. or whatever, um, or firework cannons, whatever. Um, super helpful, super helpful, because then you can actually provide value and you're not just like, yeah, I'm just here to document it. Like, we've talked to a few planners on here and like the, uh, the theme that they are always in the feedback they're always giving is like, we want you to help. We want you to help put on the event in some way, shape or form. Give us your best. Well, it's right? like, like Kaylin mm -hmm. said, it's a creative team that yeah. the, the higher up you get in the industry, there's a little bit of like a, it almost becomes like the creative team making the film is really close. And maybe the couple's kind of there sometimes. And yeah, you want to be close to them and stuff, but you're really close to the creative team that you're working with. And like, that's essential. I don't know if you found that as well, Kaylin. I'm sure you guys are incredibly close to all your couples because you only have five <laughs> of them. But I think yeah, yeah. <laughs> that it is like a requirement to be like c plugged into the vision of the other people you're working with to even pull it off at yeah. that scale. Mm -hmm. So I want to move on, Kaylin, um, and talk about color and, okay and and nerd stuff so i love color me too <laughs> so you know one of the things if you don't know kaylin runs a company called gamut and i'm sure you probably knew that but maybe you didn't um i'm sure you, if you didn't know kaylin ran it you knew about gamut i would say you guys <laughs> are known throughout filmmaking but especially in the wedding filmmaking world for your LUTs and your presets and your various other partners that you're working with kind of like how did you make a decision to be like you know what this is what i like this is the next thing i want to be doing like i'm at some point when you were doing white and reverie this became a thing mm -hmm. how did gamut start funny story um 
I mean, originally, whenever Instagram started allowing 15 second videos, that's when we started doing a lot of short form education content. That's when we started uploading things to our YouTube channel. Then we started doing um, the first iPhone wedding film. And then we did like the first like legit anamorphic wedding film. And so we kind of started pushing these boundaries and building up our YouTube channel and education space. So we had a lot of people starting to reach out wanting mentorship stuff. And then also we were getting pregnant and we needed a washer and dryer. And so we're like, we need some extra funds here. Um, maybe we can charge for some of these uh, these mentorships. And so the first year we started opening that up and literally able to buy a washer and dryer because we started doing mentorships with people and training. So a lot of people started asking questions and majority of the questions were, how do you color grade? And I really love color grading. I love to learn the details of, you know, whether it's the color science or the way the profiles react to each other um, and cameras and gear. And I just love reading manuals. That's just the way my head works. And um, so I'm always kind of creating looks or trying to push the boundaries with how I can create some kind of style. And our style is all over the place. If you look at our films, I feel like we've got, we don't have a specific template of editing or a specific template of color. We use different lots for each of our clients to some extent. Um, there's still somewhat cohesiveness there, but it's definitely different. And um, so we decided at our first venture workshop that we hosted with um, our friends uh, in the industry, David Reynosa from Forestry Films had yep. launched a LUT pack. And he told us that he made a certain amount of money over the course of two years. And I'm like, it blew our minds. And Christine was like, hey, you love color grading. Um, people ask us for this. You need to spend time and just create our first LUT pack, Go, whatever it is. do it, honey. And, yeah, and so after the first venture workshop, I literally didn't do anything but color grading for five weeks and created my first LUT pack called Tambor. Um, Tambor LUT pack. And we launched That's it. It's called Tambor and, and not Timber? It's called t- yep. So everybody. That's the very first time that I've ever noticed that. <laughs> Which is funny. Um, it is actually a musical term because both Christy yes. and I um, are musically inclined and it's the timbre, the tone of a sound and stuff. So R-E, but people say timbre and I'm like, okay. I thought it was timbre because it looked <laughs> like is, wood. Yeah, which is also, it's it's got more of those uh, earth, earthy tones. So yeah. it it still works. Okay. And <laughs> it's like some people calling me Callan instead of Kalen. I'm like, okay, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so, anyway. Timbre uh, exists. Anyway, timbre. Yeah, so timbre, lut pack. And it did really well. And we surprised that a lot of people loved it. And at the time, uh, one of my good friends, <laughs> Levi T. Arena, had a photo preset called, um, I forgot the name of it was, but he was selling the photo preset. And we're like, hey, what if it would be a great idea if we made a LUT pack that blended with that photo preset? And so then the year later, we uh, created our next LUT pack called Dolce. Um, and that was our first LUT pack that went alongside a photo preset. And that went really well. And so we're now two LUT packs in. People are loving them. Uh, and then at our third venture workshop that we had in Ghost Ranch, which Levi was doing a lot of the producing at the point, came to me with this business idea. And he said, hey, White and Reverie might not be around. Or they won't be around for a long uh, long term. And you need to think through where are you going to be five, 10 years from now? Um, these LUT packs, people love them. If White and Reverie becomes irrelevant, they're probably going to die down as well. We should create something that lives beyond just White and Reverie where we could have multiple LUT packs. We could have maybe other contributors and other people. And so at that venture workshop, we kind of pitched the original idea of Gamut. And so we spent the next six months building out business plan, coming up with our, you know, our name, trademarking everything, building up a website, and then launched our third LUT pack, which is called Adagio, which is more of like that luxury kind of bright and airy look uh, that most people kind of talk about. And then also went with a lot of other contributors that had photo presets that we adapted for video. And so that was the birth of Gamut. And so me and Levi run that full time. And that allowed us to kind of venture outside of just weddings and start getting our hands into other entrepreneurial things and running a company. And we, as of 2023, are now full time into gamut. That's the majority of my workload this year is gamut. And that allows us to put our heads down and really build out something that we're really excited about and hiring other people and creating products that people love to use. So 
that's where it's at right now. Can I tell you something I appreciate about what you guys do? Uh, besides that, it looks good, um, <laughs> um, which you know is important. <laughs> but I love about Gamut is like the prices are always so affordable. I feel like that's the opposite of what people say. Oh, because I, I sometimes. Do. Well, no, I. This is if you. Yes, you can get cheaper ones, but. I will tell you, they don't have the time put You'll in. You'll get cheaper quality ones, too. Well, yeah, the R&D, I know the time you put in. So these are like legit LUTs that are done the right way. But you're also not paying like, and this is no shade on other creators who are releasing LUTs, but like there are times I'll see someone release a LUT for like $600. And I'm like... Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Who releases? The only one I've heard of is like the Linny LUT for Ari or something like that, which is like a $600 LUT. Yeah, like, one f- like four LUT. to $600 for a LUT. And I'm like, that's just crazy. Like if you're getting a look that you're going to use for every film for an entire year for 200 bucks, <clears throat> I think that's a great value. I own, I don't know, probably we own eight of your packs in our studio right. and we use them <laughs> all the time. And like- <laughs> I use Dolce all the time still. Like, I mean, there's so many looks that are out there for you and it's just a creative tool. That being said, I think a lot of people totally misunderstand LUTs. What do you think is the biggest misunderstanding most wedding filmmakers have about how to, how LUTs work or how to properly apply them? Like what's the thing you're always having to correct people about when it comes to LUTs? I mean, most people just assume that it's a one click um stop and then it obviously looks great uh problem with that is they're probably working with bad white balance and bad exposure and these are created for proper white balance and proper exposure so a lot of the education has to come into teaching people just how to film normally (laughs) and then once you are filming normally then the LUTs work because I've bought enormous amount of packs my issue and the reason why we went this approach with the niche market of high quality LUTs but also it's more of an expensive price tag for a pack of six LUTs where I could go to another company, get 200 LUTs for the half the price. But whenever I buy a LUT, like buy those types of packs, I only use like maybe three out of the 200 LUTs ever. Cause it's always like, Hey, these look good only in this one scenario, or it looks good in only one this scenario. And that's where I've taken thousands of footage, like clips from different environments, different cameras. And I've learned all the different intricacies of each camera, what works, what doesn't. And then I make sure I'm building packs that work across the board because that was my issue is I would create a look that looks great in this beach wedding, but then it looks horrible in this, um, earthy tones, you know, wood based, uh, type of film and story. So the big thing was creating packs that were very, um, they work across the board in all these different scenarios. Um, and then we wanted to make color grading simple, you know what I mean? And part of that is with look or LUTs, which would be, you know, presets for, for video lookup tables. And they're very, basic in the sense of you it's just got an input and an output so i want red to look magenta i want green to look bluer you just create this look and it works but i think the biggest issue or the biggest thing we want people to know is that when they're buying a pack from gamut each one of the luts can stand on their own it's not we don't throw in filler luts like they are going to be a strong pack and they're going to when people use them like you said they're going to use them on all their films they're going to be tried and true you know that you're not going to have any fringing or like sky falling apart and so part of us now is building a lot of education to live uh next to all these LUT packs because part of it is people are starting to shoot log and they're trying to figure out this looks horrible why are my results bad and that was another issue where oh i launched the timbre LUT pack which originally was built off of footage from a Sony A7S in Cine 4. And then now people are wanting to use something on the Canon with C-Log 3 and it looks different or on the Sony, it looks different or Panasonic. And then that's whenever I started down the road of figuring out, okay, how can I have people using all these different cameras use our creative look and it still look the same as the way it was intended with the development. And that's kind of what birthed um, what we call base LUTs, which are technically conversion technical LUTs to take a log profile to a working color space such as Rec. 709. Yeah, we, Jared was, um, we're using that actually last week, one of the first shoots ever with the S52X shooting uh, 12-bit raw with yeah. uh with the with i mean it's probably not totally Which I, need to, I need to send you a new updated lut because that's 
that's the other world of just understanding cameras and the different sensors is the S5 II apparently, along with the S5X or S5-2X, has a little bit different things going on in color with the reds and blues. And so I've had to make another LUT adjustment specifically for that sensor, which sucks. I'm like, can't V-Log and V-Gamut just be the same? You know, why is why is Canon Log 3 different on this camera, but diff- like fine on this camera? Why are there different color space options? It's just, oh, it's a nightmare as I've been profiling and looking at all these different cameras. Yeah, I mean, but I will say it, it, it got the job done. The old base light, it got Good. the job done. We definitely, we J- Jared was like, oh, li- like it, Jared thought it looked actually great. He's like, I would deliver this. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great, but it looked great. So, um, you know, I think this could we could talk about this, Jared, which is shooting log. Mm-hmm. Like, so do y'all do y'all shoot log right now, both of y'all separately for your businesses? So, so we run we run the same business together, um, and and I would say, and we run three different shooting businesses, brand versions, uh, three right? Three different yeah, okay. brands, yeah. Um, so it depends the brand. I, I think with our <laughs> our base brand, it's really just you know kick them out. Like uh, the the level of skill isn't going to be what Jason and I could produce. But like Jay said, the shoot that we did the other day it was like, yeah, let's let's try to you know crank it out um, and and use those new cameras. And you know we're up for a challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it's a pretty big hop for someone who's not used to it. Um, I would say for a majority of our weddings, we are not shooting log. We're just, uh, we're shooting Fujifilm. And so we're shooting just a profile straight out of camera throwing. Are y'all what, Fuji for all of your weddings or just one brand? Well, uh, two of our brands, uh, Stop okay. Go Love and Merriment Films, but we might be switching potentially. To we some... switched camera. We've shot Sony, <laughs> Canon, yeah. Black Magic. Black Magic, yeah. Yeah, we uh, might be switching Fuji, over to Lumix, Lumix. For, for our Stop Go Love brand and uh, stay in merriment um, or on the Fujis. So, um, but then, yeah, Sony's, we're, we're a mix on, on our, you know, uh, high end luxury brand. But we're to answer your mix. question, we shoot yeah. log for commercial work, we shoot log yeah. for okay. luxury high end weddings. Um, here's what I'm saying, though. I know, like when I when I open up a twelve bit raw file and I'm like, oh look, the sky, it's actually there, <laughs> and it's not gone. How does it? Tell me how this makes your skin crawl, Kaylin. This is my just. I don't think clients care at all about. Oh, I, I, yeah, I hate that statement. <laughs> I know because when because like if you expose it well in camera is what I'll say. If you if you you can't mess up your in, in camera footage but people have shot beautiful content for endless ages without all the dynamic range that we have now um and this is more what i'm saying i do, i think a lot of people start shooting log a little too early in their filmmaking journey before they're ready and i know that and i i was talking to aaron tharp about it from 31 films and he's like but it's easier <laughs> It gives you more in post. And I'm like, because you know what you're talking about in post. Let's let's break this down real quick. Okay, so since y'all haven't been shooting log most of the time and you're just similarly starting to, what was your hesitancy or what's the issues with shooting log for you? Um, the native ISOs um, being way higher. I like to get down as low as possible. I don't want to use okay. any filters. Okay. And and okay. also it's it's a training side for us. If we have a bunch of people going out, like the the risk of them screwing up is high. So it's like we just have to push our team, I think, to to be on another level that, you know, maybe they're ready for now, I would say, but at one point they were not ready for it. So I think that's why we are kind of making that transition over, starting with Jay. It's and a I. different workflow, is really what it is. It, it is. It's a yeah. totally different what's, workflow. What's, What's the, well, all I'm hearing is pretty much, okay, different ISO ranges. So I don't have the freedom of just getting the lowest one. I'm stuck with the native ISO. Which okay? I mean, which means I have which, to have an ND filter. Okay. Yes. Which, which I don't so want to have yeah. to spend. I have 30 lenses. Even at a hundred from eight, a hundred ISO from 640, you're still going to need an ND on 100 sometimes. Yeah, but you can just crank your shutter. I mean, okay. okay. And that's another conversation. <laughs> this, <is> kidding. <laughs> this conversation but, is over. But the post workflow, which also, I, I mean, 
The we're postmark in Final flow Cut. isn't hard. It's so e- it's so easy. It's so, so like easy. All the clips. Yes. You go to your inspector, add the camera LUT, boom, it looks gorgeous. Or now that you're on the S5 II or S5 II X, you can just bake it in so you're yes. not shooting log anymore. You're getting a really great image, um, but you don't have to grade it in post. So that dictate. I feel like it's real easy kind of now. Well, yeah. this is what the whole thing is. Mainly, I have 58 lenses, and I'll have to spend about six thousand dollars on indie filters <laughs> and so um I, I think most people are not in our position though no, no, no. i would say for mm-hmm. most people i think kaylin i think it comes down to education i do i think it's okay yeah. a lot of people jay says a lot of people aren't ready to they they maybe try it too early um and i i think he's probably right i think there's probably not enough educational resources out there to be like Hey, what is a finishing light? If you talk to a new vide- videographer about what a finishing light is, they're going to be like, "What's that?" I thought well, a lot like, was just a lot. Was just a lot. Like they don't know what color space is. They don't even know yeah. what like bit rates are on color. They don't know what problems they're preventing mm-hmm. before they mm-hmm. even get into it. They just think like, "This is how the professionals grade their. This is the more professional look," which is mm-hmm. true. But it's only it's true for the reasons of well this person wants more dynamic range, and I think a lot of people don't they don't understand why they're doing it, and they don't understand like they don't even know what Rec 709 is. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to ask you to kind of get your idea because I get tons of inquiries all the time running a color grading you know business. I hear all the different inquiries. I have people that are like. Hey, how come it's how come how do you even import a lot? Like just some basic stuff too. And it's comes to a lot down to a lot of education. And I didn't want to do uh shoot and log for the longest time. My issue was exposure because oh, if you're viewing things in a flat profile, I don't know what my white balance is gonna look like very well. My exposure, do I overexpose, do I underexpose? But now with a lot more of the cameras being able to load a LUT internally or looking at the gamma assist, no longer do I have issues with the white balance or exposure. I can see what it looks like in there. So that reduces that threshold for me. But also I use monitors because I want to see the look. And then it's like, okay, don't need zebras. I don't need histogram. Just if the image looks good and you're at your native ISO, you're done. That's, that's my thing is um, the inclusion of either usable view assist that actually doesn't suck which yeah. <laughs> some now have some that are acceptable like you can look at it and you know this looks decent um or now with a lot of cameras the ability to load a lot on i think changes the game in a lot of ways i'm fine shooting monitors like that's how i've always shot log is we always just bring a conversion lot put it in the monitor mm-hmm. shoot rec 709 the day of and that's great it is a little, it's a different workflow. You need a lot more gear, a lot, a lot more stuff. I think now the excuses are going to go away even sooner. The more cameras that allow you to load on your own conversion mm-hmm. lots, it's going to change the game. And I do think within like two or three years, nobody will really be shooting anything but log. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I agree in the sense that that's the direction, just like we're all going to probably be shooting 4K as an, as the normal, you know what I mean? Yep. Norm. And uh, with the cameras that can currently shoot or load your own LUT into it, I mean, you've got all the Lumix cameras. So what you're looking on screen, however, some of the screens aren't <laughs> calibrated, so it's going to look a little bit different necessarily. Yep. You've got like the Canon C70, you know, mm-hmm. they can load that in. You also have um black magic you can load your own LUTs in there and stuff i know the a7s3 you can just use i think the 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 main gamma assist that's from that sony but they're getting to the point where they're going to start being able to you know load custom LUTs in there and everything and that's going to be the norm like you're saying and that's going to reduce a lot of those issues that people have and also cameras are just getting better so you don't have to necessarily overexpose like we used to with old cameras where the old a7 III hack that everyone had to do (laughs) Well, yeah, we're just like, I mean, the shadows are just so noisy. And now with S-Log3, but with 10-bit and everything, you don't have to overexpose Sony. It's just like, just shoot right at zero exposure and it will look great. And so we've dialed in our base LUTs to match that, which is what Sony. So I made, I've literally searched all the white papers for all the different camera profiles and look at what they're rated. I mean, I just shot with a Nikon Z9 in N-Log and they are rating their gray card, which is like where you should expose at 35 IRE, which is very low. 
which is very close to what Canon recommends. Um, while most cameras are shooting around 40 to 42 IRE. So what that means is uh, it's going to be a lot darker. And then when you add a LUT, it's going to raise it up in post to correct it, but you're going to get a lot of noise. So analyze, that's my job is to like analyze all the different camera profiles, figure out what the manufacturers recommend, and then create a LUT dialed in for that. Or maybe those recommended settings are not good for those cameras because like for Canon, they recommend, I think it's 37 IRE for the gray card on C-Log3. I recommend 40 or 42 because the noise is so like rough in the shadows. And so that's where I come in and then I need to create that education so people know how, hey, when you add the LUT, just shoot for that LUT and you're going to be good. Like I want to make it as super simple as possible. And that's why <laughs> we don't shoot LUT. <laughs> <laughs> because you just said IRE. <laughs> but I general, like, I do think... And my goal is to get it where you don't have to know that. Like, yes, yes. Like, just load the LUT and shoot to your eyes content. Right. And, and I think cameras are going that direction, too. Like, I think I think it's... We're about to have, like, a... I kind of... I was talking to Binge Heish today about yeah. this, and we're, like, we're, like, talking about, like, a golden age of cameras now. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think it's, I, I was like, I don't know, man, I think it's about to get better. I think they're going to like, I think the next level of like 6k is going to be normal. Mm. Yeah. A hundred percent agree that. Well, yeah. it's just like the iPhone. It's like every iteration isn't a huge jump, but it's a small jump. And over five years, it is a huge jump. And yeah, I think that's where we're getting to. Yeah. Um, so, um, Jared, and you know, you should probably ask a question because I've been asking. Well, I, I, Kaylin, <laughs> I, I would say the thing that I appreciate you, Jay, Jay had his appreciation uh, uh, point, um, is that you take a lot of the work out of our workflow. <laughs> like we don't have to do the research and I, you know, like color five years ago, six years ago to me was so foreign. It was like so complicated. It, it, it was a source of frustration for me. Um, so I think we just were like, abandon it, try to make it look good out of camera, do the Sharon thing, and then kind of go mm -hmm. from there. Now I'm looking at it with brand new eyes in the last, you know, since COVID, I think we spent a lot of time in 2020 being like, let's tweak this, let's get into this, let's start working with log. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've made it a lot easier for filmmakers to, you know, accomplish their creative goals, which I think is a big task and, and a big ask that you've kind of taken on. Um, I've really seen it fuel creatives energy um towards newer better different types of wedding films that um you know there's a wedding film aesthetic like you know five ten years ago like it was like every film looked like a still motion film and mm -hmm. now it's like you see all these different filmmakers starting to branch out a lot like photographers did 10 years ago into hey I'm going to be a, a Jonas, you know, Peterson. I'm going to be mm -hmm. a Bench Hayesh. I'm going to kind of go all these different directions in terms of style and color and something that creatives can kind of gravitate towards. So I appreciate the work that you're doing, I think, on, on the ground for a lot of filmmakers. Um, I think it goes a long way um, and, and kind of pushes the industry forward. And that's what Jay and I are always talking about. Like, what are the tools to really push mm -hmm. the industry forward? It, it's going to allow us to charge more. It's going to allow us to, you know, be more fulfilled as creatives. And so um, it's fun. So I was going to ask you something like, you know, White and Reverie is kind of like bigger than the films, I think, in terms of at least within the, <laughs> within the community. Like there are people that I'm like, they're like, who's your best favorite filmmaker? And they're like, White and Reverie. I'm like, what's your favorite film they made? Um... Like they, it's just like, it's so ingrained in people. So many, they can't choose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's like a staple and yeah, like yeah. it's influenced it, yeah. them and, and they yeah. know this is something that's influenced me. So you kind of made that mark. And now I think you have made a mark <clears throat> in this own right with Gamut. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, I don't think people go like, oh, Gamut, that's white and reverie. They're like, oh, Gamut's Gamut and white and reverie is white and reverie. A lot of yeah, like I went to I went to a workshop in Australia to the Lonely Hearts Film Camp mm. and was meeting everybody that knew who White and Reverie were. And then we were talking about some of our other color grades and LUTs and they're like, wait, you own Gamut? Yeah. I use Gamut LUTs. I didn't know. Or, so sometimes they don't even correlate it. And it's not like I'm trying to, you know, revamp or rebrand myself like, oh, I'm now in Gamut. I'm not necessarily <sighs> part of White and Reverie. It's more so this is another venture and I love creating tools for filmmakers. I love getting in the weeds and 
making life easier. I'm a very efficient workflow kind of person where I want the easiest steps to do uh, an actual task. That's why I love Final Cut, where the amount of clicks it takes to do stuff in Final Cut is way less than in Premiere, sometimes even Resolve. So that's kind of where I want to fine tune all those moments. And also I want to challenge people to get out of the mindset, which people have for different reasons of, well, the couple wouldn't care. So why should I care? (laughs) Or the couple doesn't see it. Why should I? And it's more so what do you want to re- be reflected of your work? I and But again, everyone's different. And I, whenever we create films, we obviously create it for the couple, but also we're creating it for ourselves. There's times when I've sent a film off to a client, they loved it, and I still spent five days working on it afterwards because it wasn't where I wanted it. Um, and I think that mentality of, you know, okay, do I crank the shutter or not? And it's like, well, I've noticed that whenever this movement is happening, couples don't know the technical they just know what they feel yeah. and if i can create a feeling i want them to immerse themselves into the story which is why christine's such an amazing editor and i don't edit films because i just if i edit a film it's going to look epic but you're not going to feel anything it'll look pretty but christine makes you feel stuff and that's why i think we're such a great pair for that and we've even approached stuff where okay why do i shoot log why is that even important we were filming a wedding or we knew we had a big wedding coming up the following year i followed another filmmaker that shot at that location and i realized wow the ceremony is in shade but all this beautiful scenery is in harsh light behind it i'm going to need to be able to capture that i don't want to blow that out because i don't want to take the couple out of that environment i want them to feel like they're that in that environment and i knew the tool for that was to shoot in a higher dynamic range profile so then i practiced and tested and learned how to use it properly so that when that wedding came we shot in it and it was like okay i'm immersed in that film i'm getting all the feels from that location because we chose that tool for the job. If I had the approach of, well, it'll still look good if I'm exposing properly. Yeah, but you're still going to lose this, that highlight information and that other stuff. And I think by pushing ourselves, it allows our films to be even better. And I know that we're going to, uh, we're going to have couples that want that extra touch in their films. So how does it make you feel like that you've impacted Like, do you think of yourself as like someone who's made a big difference in a lot of filmmakers lives? I don't see that, but I hear that. So there's times when I don't see the impacts of our lives, you know, sometimes, but I hear stories from people that have followed us for years or they're like, Hey, this film moved me or this is why I now do wedding films. And we've, I think we filmed four couples that are now wedding filmmakers, but at the time they were just a couple. And like after their wedding, they became wedding filmmakers because of us, which is funny because we didn't film weddings when we got married. And it was because of our wedding filmmaker that I loved. I'm like, Hey, maybe we should consider weddings because we were like, Oh, should I get a camera that can shoot music videos? But we just felt connected with and had fun with weddings. And we loved that from the wedding filmmaker that filmed our wedding, which is paperback weddings back in the day. And, uh, so I have heard that we have left an impact on people's lives, which is encouraging And now I love to hear that we're making an impact on businesses with providing color tools and assets for people and education to help them grow. Because I feel like I wouldn't say we're at our peak in the sense of that we're, you know, kind of coming down from our peak as White and Reverie, but our passions are just kind of shifting. We still love weddings. We're doing very few, but if we can help the industry in other ways, we're going to start leaning into that, which is what we've been doing through Gamut and other educational resources. Tell us about um, what kind of education you have going on. What's uh, what's cooking in the White and Reverie studios these days? Man, uh, there's so many things going on because we're doing Gamut full time. We're filming weddings. We're doing small little commercial projects here and there. Uh, but Gamut is becoming a bigger umbrella where we just acquired a time-lapse software company too, which we're going to be working on launching that part of the brand. Um, and then we're working on a few other business strategies with other equity partners and it's just going to expand into a lot of different things which we're really excited about um and then part of white and reverie is is the education space which is hard for me because i love doing education i love teaching because it also forces me to learn a topic better which is kind of a way i learned like i literally went and got my certification for final cut pro 
just because I, I wanted got that to. too. I, <laughs> like I didn't need it at the time. I'm like, I just want to take a test. I only missed one answer. It was useless. And, I, when I was taking the test in New York City, <laughs> the power went out in the building. And Are we, you serious? <laughs> yeah, we had to take it again. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway. So, and we got it. And then years later, we started doing trainings and teachings. And now we have, we created a full masterclass for Final Cut Pro that we launched a few years ago. Um, which helped a lot of companies and a lot of people that wanted to, you know, get up and running within two, three weeks, literally become an advanced editor. And I would say probably at least 30, 40% of the content in there is not even on YouTube and other stuff. It's things that we've learned and self-taught and figured out and pulled from different ideas and created a full immersive like Final Cut course. And so with that, we've been kind of just playing it quiet with that. But this past year, we've been revamping it. We're working on a lot of new content. We've just added like three more hours of content to this masterclass. And we're in the process of relaunching it to the public and making it more available so that if people are considering wanting to get become a better editor, if they want to save a lot of time, which is literally what we do, we get people that take the course. And then within a few days, they're like, oh my gosh, you just saved me three hours. I can't believe I believe I've been doing this the wrong way. Or I didn't know this was even an option. Or here's the fastest way to do multicams and color grade and just speed up people's workflow. It pays for itself with the time. And I know a lot of people have also been, you know, shifting to Resolve and Premiere's been crashing and Premiere's got possible updates in the future and Resolve's got really cool features and color and everyone's trying to figure out what's the next best thing and everyone's coming up with iPad apps now. And I think Final Cut is still such an amazing fast editor um, tool for weddings specifically. Like if you're filming weddings, Final Cut is so fast. And I've been playing with Resolve for like the past six months just to figure out how does it correlate with Final Cut? Where is it the weakest point? Where is it stronger? And when it comes to editing, I still feel like Final Cut is way more efficient than Resolve still. Yeah, I can say from experience, because um, I'm an editor by trade, probably, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, I know Premiere very well and Resolve pretty well and, and, and Final Cut really well, all the way from Final Cut 6, right? And so, <laughs> like, I tell people all the time is like, literally like we're editing for other f filmmakers, a couple hundred films a year, a lot of films in Premiere, um, a lot of films in Resolve. Nothing is faster than Final Cut. I don't care what, like there's nothing faster. Not even close. <laughs> like the multicam alone, because we're doing multicam events. Yeah. The fact that you're multi, like you're having to sync together four camera angles in almost every At other least. platform. <laughs> and in almost every other platform, it's basically useless. Like it's it's a it's a crapshoot if the thing works when you like Resolve does it very similarly, but they're syncing problem like they have a problem with syncing by mm -hmm. waveform right now. Time like uh, uh, time sync, they're able to do it really well. But the problem I've had, and then with Premiere, you'd have to use Pluralize or stuff to get it where it's all on the same tracks and stuff. And so there's there's areas for improvement, but at the point now it is. I think easier and a little bit more intuitive with Final Cut for multicams for sure. Yeah. But I mean, that being said, no matter what editing platform in LE you're choosing to use, um, you can always buy some LUTs <laughs> <laughs> and put them in there. They so, work across platforms. Yeah. So I would say uh, go check out what um, Kalen's doing. Where can everybody find your stuff, Kalen? Yeah. So if you're interested in our LUT packs, we have a lot of different varieties. Uh, you can go to gamut.io. That's our website. It's just been overhauled where you can choose a creative look, which is more of that style, or you can choose a uh, a base LUT or a conversion LUT. And that's where if you're shooting in log profile and you want it to look great, then you just grab one of those conversion LUTs and then you can choose your style with the creative LUT. So it's kind of twofold. You kind of stack them. And uh, at gamut.io, you can check those out. I think based off of when this podcast launches, we'll probably be having a special run too. So that'll be blasted on the website. Also follow us on Instagram at gamut IO as well. Um, that will be where we post a lot of stuff too and sign up for our, our newsletter stuff. But then also on our website on white and reverie, if you click on workshops, we have our masterclass there where people can sign up as well. And we're going to send out a lot more information in the coming weeks as that gets closer to launch. That's awesome, dude. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I was I was saving you for a while. And also we've had <laughs> scheduling issues and different things, but I'm I'm happy we were able to make it work and um definitely just value your contributions and everything you guys have meant to the wedding industry. 
Dude, that means a lot. Appreciate you guys having me on. Cool. Thanks, Kalen. Everyone at home, make sure you're checking out the Wedding Film School show on YouTube, anywhere you can find podcasts, as well as I mentioned before, our YouTube channel, Wedding Film School, where you can find all gear reviews. We also do our weekly live show every Thursday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we review wedding films. Go to our website, weddingfilm.school slash reviews. Try to predict who's using Dolce. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> that's where you can submit your wedding films for Jason, Bobby, and myself to review. Again, every single week, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for checking out the Wedding Film School show. See you next week right here, Wedding Film School.